gentlemen of the jury. Now, the issues we are involved with here in this particular case are fraud and deceit. And this is defined as false statements of a material fact in a transaction which are made by one party against another party. Now, these would be made with the knowledge of their falsity and with the distinct and certain intention that the other party will act on them. When another party believes such statements and bases decisions on them, then such statements are fraud when used to cause another party to enter into a contract or a deal. In cases such as this, the statements allow the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed. It must always be proved by the party who is asserting that fraud is present. And that person in this case is the plaintiff. The plaintiff must prove by the preponderance or the greater weight of the evidence that he was defrauded. If you think that the evidence weighs such that the preponderance rests on the side of the plaintiff, then you will find your verdict in favor of the plaintiff. If the evidence is equally balanced on either side, then you will not find in plaintiff's favor. It is necessary for the party claiming that he was defrauded to prove that he believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the deal. If that is not the case and the party claiming fraud did have access to the real facts in regard to the transaction in question here and relied on his own data and knowledge of those facts, then there is no fraud. Now, in this particular case, there is no fraud regarding the contents of the agreement because it is admitted by the plaintiff that Carl Sampson read the agreement to him and was familiar with the contents of it. He was not deceived as to what the agreement said. But the only question here is if the defendants did then agree to execute a promissory note for $40,000 delivered as Exhibit 6, holding it out as such a note and stated by Sampson that Exhibit 6 was the note for $40,000. Under the instructions I have given to you, if you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant, Sampson, representing the defendants at the time of the making of the settlement, represented and stated that the defendants would execute to the plaintiff a note for $40,000 and that later they delivered to the plaintiff that Exhibit 6 was a promissory note for $40,000, then you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor for $40,000 with interest added. This is only if you also find that you believe the statements and the making of Exhibit 6 were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed here. Conversely, if you do not so find from the preponderance of the evidence or if you find that the evidence is equally balanced on these issues named above, then you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. Let's try that one again. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the issues we are involved with here in this particular case are fraud and deceit. And this is defined as false statements of a material fact in a transaction which are made by one party against another party. These would be made with the knowledge of their falsity and with the distinct and certain intention that the other party will act on them. When another party believes that such statements and bases decisions on them, then such statements are fraud when used to carry another party to enter into a contract or a deal. In cases such as this, the statements allow the party injured to recover damages. Fraud is never presumed. It must always be proved by the party who is asserting that fraud is present. That person in this case is the plaintiff. The plaintiff must prove by the preponderance or the greater weight of the evidence that he was defrauded. If you think that the evidence weighs such that the preponderance rests on the side of the plaintiff, then you will find your verdict in favor of the plaintiff. If the evidence is equally balanced on either side, then you will not find in plaintiff's favor. It is necessary for the party claiming that he was defrauded to prove that he believed and relied upon the false statements made by the other party in the deal. If that is not the case and the party claiming fraud did have access to the real facts in regard to the transaction in question here and relied on his own data and knowledge of those facts, then there is no fraud. Now, in this particular case, there is no fraud regarding the contents of the agreement because it is admitted by the plaintiff that Carl Sampson read the agreement to him and was familiar with the contents of it. He was not deceived as to what the agreement said. The only question here is if the defendants did then agree to execute a promissory note for $40,000 delivered as Exhibit 6, 
holding it out as such note and stated by Samson that Exhibit 6 was the note for $40,000. Under the instructions I have given to you, if you find and believe from the evidence that the defendant, Samson, representing the defendants at the time of the making of the settlement, represented and stated that the defendants would execute to the plaintiff a note for $40,000 and that later they delivered to the plaintiff that Exhibit 6 was a promissory note for $40,000, then you will find a verdict in the plaintiff's favor for $40,000 with interest added. This is only if you also find that you believe the statements and the making of Exhibit 6 were done for the purpose of cheating and defrauding the plaintiff as claimed here. Conversely, if you do not so find from the preponderance of the evidence or if you find that the evidence is equally balanced on these issues named above, then you will find a verdict in defendant's favor of no cause of action. In order to find in defendant's favor, you must also believe that the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff were not made. Also, you must believe that the plaintiff knew the contents and terms of Exhibit 6 at the time of receiving it. If you should find a verdict in defendant's favor in this case, ladies and gentlemen, it will be the usual verdict of no cause of action. If you should arrive at a verdict in favor of the plaintiffs, it will be for the full amount discussed above the $40,000 with interest added as stated in Exhibit 6. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must put aside all prejudice and pity you may feel for either of the parties to this case and return a fair and just verdict. If you find yourselves empathizing with one side or the other in this case, you must stop immediately. If you find that you cannot deliberate on the case without bias or prejudice because of experiences of your own, you must come and talk to me. I will decide whether you may need to be excused from this jury or not. I realize that this has been a long and tedious case. I appreciate your attention and your patience. I would like to call to your attention that this case should not be discussed with anyone. The only place you should discuss this case is in the jury room where you will retire to deliberate. You should not even discuss the case with your fellow juror except in that room during your deliberations. When you reach the point in this process where you are voting, you should always review the views and opinions of the other jurors, especially if there are a number of them. However, you should never give up your own opinion if you are convinced it is correct. What the other jurors believe is important only in that it may cause you to review your opinion or rethink it if you are the only juror or one of the two or three who felt a certain way. What I think about the outcome of this case makes no difference at all. I often make comments about the testimony of different witnesses. You must ignore what I may have said or any facial gesture or any gesture I may have made with my hands that would cause you to believe that I have any opinion about the outcome of this matter. I am not allowed to entertain an opinion. And the facts in this case are your province and just as you may not invade my province when it comes to deciding the law, I may not invade yours when it comes to deciding the facts. You must select one of your number to act as your foreman while you are deliberating on this case and to be your representative during your deliberations. If you wish to communicate with me for any reason, you should put your request in writing and send the person you select as your foreman with your request. If a family member or even a total stranger asks you about this case, you are simply to tell them that you have been instructed by me not to discuss the case with anyone. You should be sure not to read any newspaper articles about this case or listen to any news programs concerning this case. I do not know how much publicity this case will receive, but it is possible that it could appear in the news. If you are interested in reading about the case, you may do so only after the trial is over. Have your family members save the newspapers for you to read once you have completed your service on this jury. <clears throat> Try that one again. In order to find in defendant's favor, you must also believe that the fraudulent representations as claimed by the plaintiff were not made. Also, you must believe that the plaintiff knew the contents and terms of Exhibit 6 at the time of receiving it. 
If you should find a verdict in defendant's favor, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, it will be the usual verdict of no cause of action. If you should arrive at a verdict in favor of the plaintiffs, it will be for the full amount discussed above of the $40,000 with interest added as stated in Exhibit 6. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you must put aside all prejudice and pity you may feel for either of the parties to this case and return a fair and just verdict. If you find yourselves empathizing with one another or the other in this case, you must stop immediately. If you find that you cannot deliberate on the case without bias or prejudice because of experiences of your own, you must come and talk to me. I will decide whether you may need to be excused from this jury or not. I realize that this has been a long and tedious case. I appreciate your attention and your patience. I would like to call to your attention that this case should not be discussed with anyone. The only place you should discuss this case is in the jury room where you will retire to deliberate. You should not even discuss the case with your fellow juror except in that jury room during your deliberations. When you reach the point in this process where you are voting, you should always review the views and opinions of the other jurors, especially if there are a number of them. However, you should never give up your opinion if you are convinced it is correct. What the other jurors believe is important only in that it may cause you to review your opinion or rethink it or if you are the only juror or one of two or three who felt a certain way. What I think about the outcome of this case makes no difference at all. I often make comments about the testimony of different witnesses. You must ignore what I may have said or any facial gesture or any gesture I may have made with my hands that would cause you to believe that I have any opinion about the outcome of this matter. I am not allowed to entertain an opinion. The facts in this case are your province and just as you may not invade my province when it comes to deciding the law, I may not invade yours when it comes to deciding the facts. You must select one of your number to act as your foreman while you are deliberating on this case and to be your representative during your deliberations. If you wish to communicate with me for any reason, you should put your request in writing and send the person you select as your foreman with your request. If a family member or even a total stranger asks you about this case, you are simply to tell them you have instructed by me not to discuss the case with anyone. Read any newspaper articles about this case or listen to any news programs concerning this case. I do not know how much publicity this case will bring, but it is possible that it will appear in the news. If you well, are if I were to tell you, you that I was still having telephone conversations with Attorney Guyton on the 23rd concerning your order, how would you explain that? I don't know. But to my notes, I have where I called Rosalind. Okay. So when was your first interview with Mrs. Mabee? I don't have that on my calendar. I talked to her on the phone before I went in for an interview. Had you hired her by July 24th? I believe so. And by that date, you expressed to her your concern that the child might be molested or was being molested? Yes. I told Mrs. Mabee what Sarah told me. If I told you in a letter dated July 21st from Mrs. Mabee to me that she discussed only the issue of the preschool payment, how would you explain that? That no mention was made of any problem of molestation? I believe she told me not to tell anybody else. We were supposed to wait until Sarah has got to go to Dr. Aguirre. And if I told you that I had telephone conversations with your attorney, Mrs. Mabee, on July the 31st, on August the 6th, and that in neither of those conversations was the issue of molestation mentioned, how would you explain that? Objection? Speculative? How could she answer that? Did you instruct Mrs. Mabee or not? Or the party claiming that he was defrauded to the issue of molestation with your husband's attorney or with anyone else? I take it. You have withdrawn the question. Do you now know the fact question? No. Was the reporter reading the question? I don't have his okay. knowledge of those things. To pursue the issue of the molestation, I asked her for advice, yes, as counsel. And was it your intent at that time to try to take some legal action to get protection for your daughter? Yes. And Mrs. Minky represented you throughout the month of August. Is that correct? Yes. Were you aware that Mrs. Minky and I met several times at the courthouse to discuss objections, grounds, finish your question? Were you aware that your counsel and I met several times at the courthouse to discuss
discuss setting up a hearing date on the issue of the preschool payments. Yes, I believe she told me. Were you aware that in none of those conversations was the issue of molestation mentioned to me or that it was a problem? I wouldn't know. During that three week period that you had, Sarah, which would have run from July 20th until about August the 10th, did you have Sarah examined by a psychologist? I believe so, Carol Geary. I am not sure if I, if Sarah saw her or I saw her by myself. I think that was just the time when I saw her by myself. Do not so find from the preponderance of the evidence, or if you find that the evidence is equally balanced on these issues named above, then you will find you instruct Mrs. Minkies to pursue the issue of the molestation, I asked her for advice, yes, as counsel. And was it your intent at that time to try to take some legal action to get protection for your daughter? Yes. And Mrs. Minkies represented you throughout the month of August, is that correct? Yes. Were you aware that Mrs. Minkies and I met several times at the courthouse to discuss objection grounds? Finish your question. Were you aware that your counsel and I met several times at the courthouse to discuss setting up a hearing date on the issue of the preschool payments? Yes, I believe she told me. Were you aware that in none of those conversations was the issue of molestation mentioned to me or that it was a problem? I wouldn't know. During that three-week period that you had, Sarah, which would have run from July 20th until about August the 10th, did you have Sarah examined by a psychologist? I believe so. Carol Gary. I am not sure if I, Sarah saw her or I saw her by myself. I think that was just the time when I saw her by myself. So the answer to my question then is no, is no. And during that period of time between July 20th and August 10th, did you have Sarah examined by a physician? No. Did you have Sarah talk to anybody about what was allegedly being done to her? She talked to me and to neighbors, yes. She talked to neighbors, yes, okay. And then you let Sarah go back to her father on August the 10th, right? Yes. And on August the 14th, Mr. Klieger called you concerning the vaginal irritation that your daughter was suffering? Yes. And in fact, you met him at the doctor's <coughs> office on the 10th, is that true? Yes. And in fact, you called Dr. Aguirre on the 15th, isn't that true? Yes. And you didn't have Sarah that coming weekend, did you? No. It wasn't until a week later, actually a week and a half later, that's correct, that you picked Sarah up? Correct. And then you took her to see both Carol Gary and Dr. Aguirre? That's correct. So throughout all this period of time, you believed that the child was being molested. You let her go back to her father. You didn't have an attorney take action such as the ex parte action that you took on the 27th or make any other attempt to protect your daughter from this alleged molestation. That's correct. Okay. Mrs. Minkies asked you about a telephone conversation in July, I believe. Was that telephone conversation maybe around July 9th? Telephone conversation with whom? With your daughter, Sarah, and with your former husband. Was it regarding what now? Well, I believe you testified there was an altercation over the phone. Yes, I believe you said Sarah called at you. Yes, and that wasn't, let's see, right around July 9th. Is that about right? I believe so. Okay. Isn't it true that you called to speak to Sarah? Could be. Isn't it also true that while you had Sarah on the phone, you told her her friend, Josh, was there at your house, and wouldn't she like to come home and play with him? I did not say that. I said, would you like to talk to him on the phone? And they happened to come over for a visit. <clears throat> 200, four boys for five minutes, no reading. Okay, and starts with question by plaintiff's attorney. <clears throat> Is that the office marked foreman's office there? Yes, I put it into that office. I have a big storage cabinet in there with a lock on it, and I put it in there. Did you lock that cabinet that time? Yes. Now, did you tell anyone that you were putting that petty cash box in the foreman's office cabinet? No. I never tell anyone where I am putting the petty cash at night. Why, on this particular night, did you put it in the foreman's office as opposed to locking it in your own desk? Well, because of the extra amount in it, I felt a little nervous about it. 
At the time that you put it away, you felt that there was more money than you usually have? Oh yes, much more. Was there any other reason that you felt nervous on that particular night? Well, the fact that he had done it in front of other people. I told him later, you should never, if you are going to hand me anything like that, don't do it in front of other people. When you say other people, who was there other than yourself? Dan was there, and there was also another girl in that office working with me that day. One of the secretaries? Yes. Who was that? Nancy Bailey was her name. Does she work on the day crew of the secretarial staff? Uh-huh. And whether or not she saw it or not, I don't know. Do you know how Mr. Moore got to the plant that day? What mode of transportation? Yes, it would have been his motorcycle. Well, did you see his motorcycle there that day? Yes, as I went over to check the building when I was leaving. As I say, it must have been about a quarter to six when I left. I went over to check the building and I saw his motorcycle locked inside of Plasmet's gates. Now, when you say locked inside the gates, is that the gates to your sister company? No, that would be our plant there. We have the two buildings side by side and each one has its own set of gates to lock it up. And the ones in the rain time division or Bob Job's division, those gates were locked and his bike was inside those gates. Now, had Mr. Moore already left at the time you saw the motorcycle there? Yes, he and Bob left about a half hour after he came. And this was before you went out and saw the motorcycle locked in the gates? Would you repeat that? Mr. Moore and Mr. Job had left about a half an hour before you say you saw the motorcycle locked inside the gates? Yes, at least. Is it your function or was it your function on May 12th to make sure that the front door to the building going into the lobby was locked when you left our building? Yes. Was that door locked when you left? Yes, it was. About what time did you leave that night? About a quarter to six. Was everything in order in the front office or the foreman's office when you left? Uh-huh. Is that a yes? Yes, it was. Yes. Now, at the time that you were handed the roll of bills in the front office, you say you put the money in the petty cash box. Is that correct? Uh-huh. Yes. Now, where did you put the petty cash box at that time? It was down in my lower right-hand drawer. It wasn't until you were about to leave the building that you then put it in the cabinet? That's right. I have no further questions. Is the cabinet you are talking about with the lock in it steel or wood? Steel. Who has the key? I have the key. And did you lock it that night after putting the petty cash box in it? Yes, I did. Did you take the key home with you? Uh-huh. Go ahead, sir. Do you normally keep the petty cash in your desk drawer? I did during the day, but I didn't always leave it there at night. Did you frequently leave it there at night? No. Did you ever leave it there at night? No. I would say it was left other places about 75% of the time. So, 25% of the time you left it in your desk, is that right? Uh-huh. And when you left it in your desk, for that matter, when you left it anywhere, it normally had petty cash in it? Yes, uh-huh. To your knowledge, had your office or the establishment there been robbed prior to this occasion? No. You weren't familiar with any pattern of thefts? No. How about immediately after this occasion? Objection, Your Honor, to immediately after as being remote, sustained, did you have any spot that you left it frequently when you didn't leave it in your desk? Yes, I had another place I left it in quite often. Was that the same place you put it on this occasion? No, no. This was an entirely different one. It's just a very small office. You know, you just kind of play it by ear. Only so many places? Yes. I have no further questions. Anything else? I have no other questions. Okay, starts with the court, going into direct by plaintiff's attorney. 184 words for five minutes. <clears throat> Raise your right hand, please. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pending before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and 
nothing but the truth, and so help you God, I do. Be seated, state your name, and spell the last name, please. My name is Deputy Roy Nesvold. What was your occupation and assignment on May 12, 1972? I am a Deputy Sheriff currently assigned to the Norwalk Station Patrol. Were you so assigned on May 12? Yes, I was. Now, on May 12, did you go to the Plasmet Engineering Company? Yes, I did. About what time? Oh, it was about 9.30. And why did you go there? I had a call to take a burglary report. Now, on arriving at the Plasmet Engineering Company, where did you first go when you got to the building? I went into the office area. Now, in going into the office area, did you enter through the front door which leads to the lobby? Yes, I did. And did you notice anything unusual about the front door of that building? The front door, it was a glass door. It had a large hole, approximately 14 inches in diameter, that was broken in two right next to the locking mechanism, and there were bits of glass laying inside on the floor inside the office. And upon going into the lobby, did you then go into the office area? Yes, I did. Now, directing your attention to the diagram marked People's One, does that represent the office area and lobby that you saw that night approximately? Yes, it does. Did you walk into that front office area? Yes, I did. What did you observe about the front office area? I observed the desk drawers to be open and apparently the inside had been completely rummaged through. Everything was a mess inside the drawers. Did you walk into the office that is labeled foreman's office on that diagram? No, I didn't. Did you ever go into any of the back offices to inspect a cabinet? No, I didn't. Did you take a report of things being missing at that time? Yes, I talked to the owner and he thought that there was a metal box with some money missing. I have no further questions. Cross-examination. Did you observe some sort of a bar or club that was in the area of the broken glass? No, I didn't. Did you observe anything which could have been used to break the glass? No, I didn't. Were you present when someone placed a call to the Job residence? Yes, I was. Were you present that evening when Mr. Moore on my right returned with Mr. Job and came to the office? Yes, I was. And about what time was that? I don't recall exactly. It was approximately, probably within about an hour after I had taken the original report. Were there any drawers on the floor of the lobby? No. Drawers open? No. Just in the office area? Were there any drawers on the floor in the office area? No. Any indication anything had been moved? Well, what do you mean? Papers or...